three or four Sundays in Second Thessalonians as we head to Easter. Casey, it's good to see you today, sweetheart. Always good to have you with us. <clears throat> Let's begin reading in verse 1. We're going to read all the way through the end of the chapter, 12 verses. Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of Thessalonians and God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and love, all, the, all you have for one another is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith and all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. There will, this will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in the blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord from the glory of his might. On the day he comes, he will be glorified by his holy people to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you have believed <clears throat> because you have believed our testimony to you. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and that you by his power may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our, Lord, of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we ask you to just bless us as we dig into this chapter, as we try to see the message that you have for us today. We ask you to watch over us to strengthen us and work mightily among us by your Spirit. It's through the blessed name of our Savior Jesus we pray, and amen. Second Thessalonians follows up, of course, of First Thessalonians, and, and the, the tone is, is a little different in this, that um, he seems to be uh, not frustrated, but it's like, I've got to really get the point home to you. You don't, you don't seem to be getting it. You didn't get it. that you, you haven't missed the coming of Jesus. That's going to be chapter 2. That you're, you've got to live. And yet some of them were, were growing in their, and they were a testimony. And he says, I, I love telling the story, but I want you to be reminded in the midst of this culture that you're living in, and they were living in a culture that, was, that had lost sight of a of God, of lost sight of God being in control, lost sight of God bringing judgment upon the world. And he says, y you've got to, to stay strong. And so he starts off by, of course, the typical first century type writing, but then pick up in verse 3 and verse 4, and he says, we ought always to thank God for you. That, that term ought, anytime you see that in Scripture, uh, the Apostle John used it in 1 John quite a bit. One, and the, the term is a strong term of this is something that you are responsible to do. This is, this is speaking that you personally have an obligation to carry forth in doing this. And so as he uses this term, he says we ought to what? Notice what he says. We ought to thank God for you brothers and sisters and rightly so. That, that when, when we think about something, in their culture, you know, <clears throat> they were a tight-knit group. But they still had the, the same struggles. They, had, they had, knew they had to lean on each other. They knew they had to lean on God. They knew they had to, to come together and hold it all together. And because they had to do that, he, he is saying, I, I want you to understand something. You should be thankful for each other. That, and he says, I'm thankful for you. He says, every day, 
I'm thankful for you for, but because of, of what you're doing and because of who you are. And he says, I see something that's happening in your life. I see what's happening in your life and I can't help but brag about what's going on. Number one, he says, I see your faith increasing. Now, faith increasing, when you think about that, that, that he is saying that there is something about your faith that it just continues to grow in the face of opposition. You know, it, it is not hard to say Jesus is Lord. It is not hard to say I have faith in God. But it is very difficult to say Jesus is Lord. And it is very difficult to have a growing faith in God when you're under pressure. Now think about that. If there's no pressure, if there's nobody pushing against you, it's not hard. But it's very difficult when you're in a situation where he says, listen, you are facing trials, you are facing persecutions, you're facing things that are coming against you. And in the midst of that, they didn't compromise who they were. Instead, their faith was growing in God, their trust in God, their, their, everything about them was just growing. It, it's, it's amazing to me, I, I watched a one afternoon, watched a, a, a documentary on some strange, it wasn't strange Christian practices, but it was just things where uh, parents would send their kids to these Christian schools. And there was one that was founded in the Dominican Republic. And these troubled these Christian parents who had troubled teenagers would send them there. And uh, it was very expensive. And they would send their kids to this, these places. And it turns out that the United States has like, there's about 1,500 of these types of facilities that are run by Christian organizations. And the one in the Dominican Republic was quite harsh in the way that they treated the kids there. If they acted up in any way, I mean, it was like, it was brutal. And this young lady who was a, a, a Christian young lady who was attending college, that she had heard about this place, and so she wanted to go see it for herself, and she didn't know any of the harsh treatments and any of the things that was going on. And so... She flew to the Dominican Republic and she went up and she said, I'm doing this documentary on these types of programs and how they work and do they work and, you know, does it help the kids and all this kind of thing. And so she talks about it, the first of the documentary, about how she grew up and her parents did not believe in God. And very little of her family believed in God, but she had come to... Or, faith in God and had gone on these mission trips and done all of these things and so she went in and she filmed and she saw how this school was run she began to interview some of the students and some of the students at the beginning of the documentary were very open about how they were treated and and some of them were you know one kid was like I need you to get a message out I I'm in trouble please get me out of here. I'm getting ready to turn 18 years old and they're telling me they're not going to let me free. That they're going to keep me here. And I'm, I'm being kept as a prisoner and please get me out of here. And so this documentary was filmed over about a four-year process and the kid did get out of the school and, and was set free. But anyway, there's a long story. But what was interesting was that at the end of the four-year period, here was a lady who was filming this, who said she had a strong faith at the end of the documentary, who had gone through nothing, no pressure, no anything, said, I no longer believe in God. And I'm watching this documentary and I went, how could, what, what? I'm, I'm not getting it. And so I went online and looked her up and read about some of the things that she said and all kinds of things. And as I'm reading this and I'm, I'm looking at it, I'm going, 
what happened to your faith? And she said, well, I have no, I have no faith because of what others have done. And I'm like, my faith is not in what others do. My faith is in God. Others will let you down every time. We will let each other down many times. But God will never let us down. And so here is a, here is a group of Christians that Paul looks at them and he says, your faith just increases. And he says, your faith is increasing in God. I'm just telling everybody about it. So here we are in the midst of an unbelieving culture that now has begun over the last 25 years, our culture began pushing back against an idea of serving God to the point that where we are today, where, where I think we're going to see more and more and more pressure put on believers where God is calling on us to grow in our faith. As a result of our faith growing, he says, they also were growing in their love for each other. Now, in the midst of a world that is filled with hatred, it is up to us to grow in our love for each other. That means that we, we love even when we let each other down, we love. Even when we, you know, even when we face unlove, we love. Now, that, that's why. Why do we do that? Because it, it goes back to an understanding of something. We talked about this in Sunday school this morning. It goes back to this. Who loves us no matter what? God does, right? What's, how is the law of Moses summed up? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then another text that they included to sum up the law of Moses and your neighbor as yourself so it goes to we love God well how do we show that we love God by loving others now one of the things that's interesting to me is that God Jesus said there's two very difficult things that Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount to me Two of the most difficult things that Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount are turn the other cheek and love your enemies. Right? Anybody, anybody in this room? Okay, I'll just ask it this way. Does anybody in this room not have a problem with that? Loving your enemies and pray for those persecutors. And nobody shot their hand up and went, nope, don't have a problem with that. We all have a problem with that. Alright, so he says, now let me ask you something. Does God love our enemies? Yes. yes. That's the hard part, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The very difficult part of that is loving, that, knowing that God loves the person we're having a hard time loving. Right? That's the hard part. God loves them, so God is saying, I love them, so what's he calling on us to do? Love them. Very difficult. But let me tell you something. Before, before you can love your enemies, you've got to love your fellow believers. Now think with me for a moment. If you don't love, if you don't love your brothers and sisters, you're sure not going to love your enemies. I heard a guy speaking many years ago, and this, this just made, it just was profound in its simplicity. And I've shared this before. But he said he was at a mission conference. And at this mission conference they were talking about, you know, we've got to love people. We've got to love. We've got to send missionaries out. We've got to go. We've got to go. We've got to go. And he said he left one of the conferences and he had gone out to a restaurant with a group of friends. And he said there were other people from the conference and they were in the restaurant. And he says, we all sat down and we're eating and we're having a good time and we're fellowshipping. And there were people at this other table who had, you know, were part of this mission thing and, and trying to get missionaries together and raise money. And they, the, the, the kitchen messed up on their order and the, they just fussed and they just hollered and you know at the the poor waiters and the waitresses that were trying to take care of them he says it was busy and there were people in there and he said he it dawned on him we have no right to try to go on a mission to China 
And he said it so profound to me was until we can treat the people right who carry the china to us in a restaurant. He says if you can't treat them right, you have no business going on a mission trip. And he says, so it begins with treating and loving. And so Paul says, here is the church that is growing in their faith. And he says, you're growing in your faith. Now you've got, you're growing in your love. Your love for each other is ever increasing. So we love each other. And we've got to grow in that. And when we grow in that, in the midst of a culture that is filled with hate. Let me tell you, if we, are, if we allow hate in we're no different than our culture. Now think about that. We're no different than anybody else if we're allowing hate in. And so he says that we've got to be growing in our love. Why? Because in the midst of all of this growing faith and love, their persecution was growing at the same pace. It's interesting the way he writes this. He says, so here is this... Pressure from the outside is coming in. Let me tell you something. There's two, two things we've got to do when pressure comes against us, and that is that we have to unite together. Whenever pressure comes, and, and what's amazing is, is that when pressure comes, the temptation is, especially in our culture today, whenever there is pressure, is flight. We just run away. People go, oh, I don't like conflict. I don't like problems. Right? Look at, look at what's happened. Look at what's happened. I mean, it, it is amazing to me because I mean, you look at the divorce rate. You look at the, uh, the families just fall apart and, and, and all kinds of things. And, and it's because we have developed this mindset that if I don't like something, I'm just gone. I'm just, I'll just run away from God. So he says that what's got to happen is, is that we have to be the place that when we're together as a body of believers that we are growing in our faith and we're growing in our love for each other because there's going to be pressure against us. And so that's the unified front that we've got to present to our world. Secondly, notice what he says to the church and that is he says, guess what? He says, you've got to let God be in control of dealing with the problems. Now listen to what he says. He says, I want you to understand something. God's the judge, not us. God's the one that will bring it all together. Listen to what he says. He says, verse 5, he says, All this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with, power, with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out of the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among those who have believed. This includes you because you believed our testimony to you. So notice what he says there. He says God is in control. God God is the judge. Let me tell you something. I wish we could get this in our minds. Quit worrying about what everybody else thinks about you. Quit worrying about those that trouble you. Let it be water off a duck's back. But you better be worried about what God thinks about you. That's what he's saying here. He's saying, listen, he said all this is right, that you'll be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. And he says, he says to this church, he says, don't, you, 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 you understand that those that trouble you, you know, let's, let's face it, let's face it. Now, some of you are going to set up and want to go, oh, I'm just so righteous and above all that bull. Every one of us have contemplated getting even with somebody that's wronged us. Right? Right? We don't want to admit it, but we've contemplated it. No amount of my imagination of getting even with somebody will be as good as me letting God get even with them. Think about that. 
Think about that for a moment. Talking to a friend many years ago. He was, he was really, really, really struggling with something and he was, he was contemplating doing something where he would have ended up in jail. He, it was just, that's just what was going to happen. He was going to end up in jail. And I said, if you carry on with this, this is where you're headed. You need to, you need to stop and you need to think about what you're doing. And he said, well, oh, you know, he's just so upset and he's so angry. And I said, listen, you better calm down because if you don't, you're going to end up getting arrested and you will go to jail. And I said, you know what I will do? And he goes, what will you do? I said, I'll come and see you in jail. And he goes, well, what will you say to me? And I'll say, I'll look at you and I'll say, watch this. I can come in and I can go out. And I can come in and I can go out. And you can't because you wouldn't listen to me. He said, oh, yeah, that's true, isn't it? I, I went, it's the confinement. Do you understand where you're headed? Will you just back up and let this play out and let God work? Now, but that's hard, isn't it? Why? We talk about this in Sunday school too. Why is it so hard to let God be the judge? Because there is satisfaction, we think, in carrying out something, right? Why is it when we're... Not all of us are like this, but some of us are. You know, why is it that if something is broken it won't work and you've got a hammer why is there so much satisfaction in beating it <laughs> right why is there so much satisfaction if you've got something that won't work and you can throw it there's satisfaction in that in there you know unless it's light and it won't crash but if it's heavy and it'll crash then there's satisfaction right you know, it's like we had this computer that would lock up on us all the time. And it just kept, and finally we got a new one and we replaced it. And we had it in the garage and I will never forget, we took it out in the backyard one day and I said, hey, we've got to dismantle this. And somebody had told me, oh, make sure you get the hard drive out because somebody gets the hard drive, you know, they could get your information, anything, you know, because it's still on there. We took that thing out. Let me tell you, I'd like to see them get some information off that hard drive. I remember one time at a men's thing, we were sitting around the fire in the backyard and Mark Smith had a, a cell phone that wouldn't work right. And this phone, he'd be talking and it had just died. He put up with that for two years because of his contract that he had to put up with this phone that would never, ever, and they would say, there's nothing wrong with this phone. And, and he would show me, it would lock up, it would shut off, it would do all kinds of things. I have a picture of it. We, we built this big magnificent fire and we laid a board in there just right and then we just, he just gently laid that phone down there. The guys that were there, he laid that there and we all just sat back and watched. Now the rest of us were just like, hey, that's cool. To Mark it was like, yes, yes, mess up on me now, phone. There was some satisfaction to it. Now, he's, God is calling on us God is calling on us to take a step back and let Him work. Our role is to share the good news of Jesus. Unfortunately, there are always going to be people who will not listen. Let me tell you something. And this is hard. This is not, this is not pleasant for us to talk about. On the day that Jesus comes back, people that didn't obey the gospel, people that have not come to Jesus, will be lost. God's not going to just go, Oh, I changed my mind. That's hard. And it sounds judgmental. And it seems like, Oh, wow. You know, man, we don't want to think about that. We don't want to discuss that. But here, notice what he says. He says, on the day he comes back, he will judge those who have not obeyed the gospel. That is very difficult to talk about, but it's truth. 
The truth is, when He comes back, people that haven't come to God are lost. And it's heartbreaking and it's horrible. But He says, let me be the judge. Let me take care. Let me deal with the people that hurt you. I will give you relief. I will give you, I will deal with it. But that's so difficult because we want the satisfaction of dealing with it. And he's saying, let me tell you, nothing you could do will be as powerful as what I'll do. Step back and let me work. And then finally, notice what he says. He comes back to this idea of praying again. He, we talked about this briefly last week, but listen to what he says in verse 11. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you. Now think about this. Praying for each other. There is so much power in this of just uplifting each other. He says, with this in mind, we constantly pray for you. That our God may make you worthy of His calling. Okay, so what's He asking? He says, we are constantly asking that God work in you to make you worthy. One of the things that has just become lost and was in their culture and within our culture, one of the things that is lost and becoming shield off or I don't know how else to put it is the idea that God calls on us to live differently. When we come to Jesus, He is calling on us to live differently. Where we quit worrying about what our culture thinks and we start worrying about what God thinks. And He says, I'm constantly praying that God will make you worthy. That you will be different. God knows what we're doing. You can't hide anything from God. Um, I saw a picture a friend put up and it showed a, a man standing behind a fence post and it's just a regular fence post here. And this man is standing behind it trying to hide behind this fence post. Well obviously, unless you're blind, you're going to see the dude standing behind the fence post, right? You know? And it said, this is a good illustration of us trying to hide our sin from God. That we try to hide who we are from God when God knows who we are. And he says, we pray constantly that you will be found worthy. Now, now think about that because God is calling on us to be a people who are different. So he says, we're constantly praying for each other. Worthy of His calling. What is it that needs to be changed in my life? I need to be praying about it. I need others praying about it. What is it that you need changed in your life? You need us praying about it. And then He says, And by His power, that He may bring up to fruition your every desire for goodness, and your every deed prompted by faith. Now, now think about what he's saying. He says, we're constantly praying for something worthy of his calling. And that God will bring to light. That God will bring about everything in your life that you've been praying about that will bring about goodness. Now think about that. Your every desire for goodness now, think about this, about your prayers, about how you pray. Praying goodness, that, that God will work out goodness in people's lives. Now, think about that. It just, it's, it, to me, it's, a lot of times when we pray, you know, we'll pray, oh, uh, God, uh, heal this person, God, uh, take away their pain. God take away, you know, all this. He says, we're praying that your faith, the things that are brought about by your faith, he's saying, we're praying that God will bring it about. 
That God's going to make it happen. The good things. The good things that you're desiring to take place. We're praying that God will do that. We're constantly praying that. Now, look further at what he says. He says, we pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and in him according to the grace of our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, we're praying these things, what? So that God may be glorified. A friend of mine and I were talking this week and as John Slavin, he was in the hospital and we were talking and John was kind of fun to talk to uh, one day when I went to see him because he was really, really on the pain meds. So he was, he was pretty funny. So we were talking, this was on Tuesday, and we were talking. and I said, man, there's a lot of poli- politicians coming to Northwest Arkansas this weekend. I said, you know, they're all coming to Springdale Christian Church. And for a second he believed me because of the pain meds. <laughs> I said, yeah, Rubio's speaking Saturday night. Ted Cruz will be here Sunday. If Ted Cruz would have been here Sunday, we would have had to contain Linda. He makes her heart beat faster. <laughs> and so uh, we would have had to, we've had, had to have a bodyguard for Linda and for him, you know. And the Secret Service, look out. Don't let, if she breaks free, <laughs> we're not responsible. And he said, he was like, John was like, wow, really? And I was like, and he went, uh, don't tell me stuff like that when I'm stoned, you know. But I always have to question, you know, whenever a politician shows up at church who they're, who they're bringing glory to. I don't care what side of the aisle they're on. When they show up at church, it's like, what do you want? He says... Who should be gloried? You see, it's not about me. It's not about you. It's about who? It's about Jesus. And he says, I pray that all this, he says, I constantly pray that Jesus will be gloried. Now, last Monday, I went and... and Prayed with Roberta before her surgery and sat with Chuck till just about hers was done. And then I'd promised John because he had asked me and asked me and asked me, will you come? Will you anoint me with oil and will you pray over me before my surgery? And so I knew that it was getting close. And so Roberta and Chuck, they were in Northwest and John was in Washington Regional. And so I left and I headed to Washington Regional. I get down there and I need to go back into the surgery prep area. Well, they keep the doors closed. And so used to, and they changed their policy. It seems like one time you go up, you have to ask to get in. The next time you go up, you push a button and the door's just open for you. So I've just learned to stop and ask. So I stopped at the the desk and I said, ma'am, I need to get back to see John Slavin. She said, are you sure he's back there? I said, yes, ma'am, I'm sure. She said, how do you know? I said, they posted a picture of themselves on Facebook. Now there's the truth right there. And she said, oh, okay. Some people would know more about that than others. Okay. You know, so can you, can you? She goes, well, let me call back and see if you can come back. Thank you. So I stepped back and I waited and I've got my backpack with my, my oil in it, praying my oil's not leaking over my Bible, you know, type of thing. And so, you know, I've got it all in there. So I'm waiting. And she says, yes, you can come back, but who are you? I said, I'm Daniel Dickard, pastor, pastor, one of the pastors of Springfield Christian Church. She said, okay. So she tells the nurse and the nurse says, yes, he can come back. And so she hangs up the phone and says, you can go back. She says, just push the button back there. The door should open for you. Okay, thank you. So I start to walk away and she goes, hey, you don't look like a pastor. I said, yeah, I know. Well, what's a pastor supposed to look like? She said, good point. I said, I've got to go. I've got to get back there. So I get back there and pray with John and everything. So I'm thinking about that. Thinking about that point that she said, you don't look like a pastor. You know what? I don't care. 
used to that kind of thing bother me. It doesn't bother me anymore. Seriously, it doesn't bother me. I just, I just kind of have fun with it. Do you know what I don't ever want? I was thinking about this doing down the road. I don't ever want, I don't ever want somebody looking at me and saying, you don't act like a Christian. Now think about that. I don't want that. I do it sometimes. And you know what? I know y'all and so do you. But I don't want somebody ever looking at me and going, well, you don't act like a Christian. If somebody says that, then I, I should put the brakes on and go, what? Because the second I'm not acting like a Christian, I'm not glorifying Jesus. That's why it's so important we are constantly praying that God works in our lives. Letting God work. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We praise you. We ask you to work in our lives. Father, increase our faith. Increase our love. Increase our perseverance. Father, help us to just turn things over and let you work. Help us let you be in control because we know when you're in control, the things that work will work so much better. And Father, we constantly need you working that we may be counted worthy of our walk, of who we are, of our calling. And Father, we ask you to work in our lives to bring about the goodness that we seek in others. And Father, most importantly, we ask that Jesus be glorified in who we are. Father, we just praise you and we love you for everything you give us. So through the blessed name of our Savior, Jesus, we pray. Amen.